So I have the opportunity to speak something about my spiritual master, 
who by good fortune, I had the good fortune to be initiated by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. So I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement in London. I'm from the UK and I was working in London and I had the opportunity to purchase a Krishna book one day. Not from a devotee though, from a store. It was a Saturday and I was wandering and I came into this shop and I saw this beautiful silver book with this wonderful color picture on the front of a, a couple embracing. Later on I found out this was Radha and Krishna. I didn't know anything. I did not recognize that this is Krishna, but I heard something about Krishna because, well, the devotees had come to the UK and when they came to the UK, they were, they were very enterprising people and you can understand, you know, they had special talents. They were really incredible personalities, the three couples. They were just amazing people and that's why they, they got some amazing results. And when they first came to the UK, they got an article printed in a, a prominent English Sunday newspaper. And there was a picture, you know, the devotees, they were so intelligent. They, they had a picture taken of them coming off the airplane, the three couples with the young baby, Jamsundar and Malati, had the little baby girl, Saraswati. And they came dressed as devotees. They came to England dressed as devotees. And uh, they, they had that picture taken of me coming off the airplane. And they put that picture was published in the English newspaper. I was at the university at that time and studying and I saw the article and I read it. And it was, it was very nice. It was explaining how the Hare Krishna chant had come to England. Of course, uh, they managed to meet George Harrison. Well, it was really the enterprise of Shamsundar Prabhu that he was so and such an enterprising individual that he could make friends with such prominent people. George Harrison was like a very big man in the world and Shamsundar could become his friend and they would sit and talk to each other for a long time. You know, George, as we would call him as devotees, he was called him George. He, he, he was conscious of his position that he was very, that he was world famous. And some, I remember he came to the temple one time in England. It was our old temple, number seven, Buri Place. It was a rented house. It was the first temple, the first center in the UK. And uh, he came there one afternoon. You know, we devotees were talking to him. But he was always conscious who's there, who's watching, who's looking. He was conscious of being prominent in society. But he had the experience. One day he was walking in the street with Shamsundar. And Shamsundar Prabhu was dressed as a devotee with a shaved head and a shika. And he was walking with George Harrison. And George Harrison saw more people were looking at Shamsundar than were looking at him. Usually he would think everybody's looking at me. 
But when he was with Shamsundar, he thought more people were looking at Shamsundar than were looking at him. So that made it made an impression on him. The devotees came to London and they were very enterprising. You know, for for almost two years they had no place and they didn't have much money either. They came with very less money. Somehow they just managed to get money here and there. Shamsundar could do things like uh, renovate people's homes and rebuild the kitchens or put in a new bathroom for them. He could do things like that. He could restore buildings. And he did that when we got to Berry Place Temple. He brought wood, he brought this redwood timber with him all the way from California. When they came to England, he brought this wood with him. <laughs> Could you imagine? You want to bring wood, uh, big lumps of wood, he brought it to England and he used it to make the interior of the very place temple. And he made the whole place, it was, it was like a Noah's Ark. You know, in, in, in Christianity, we, we have the Noah's Ark. The time of the devastation, there's a flood, and Noah has an ark with a boat, and everyone gets on the boat, and it's kind of like uh, Satyabrat and the Manchi Avatar. When there was a devastation, Satyabrat brought the sages, and they got on the boat, and Manchi appeared and pulled, pulled the boat across the ocean of devastation. So Sham Thunder made the interior of the very place temple. It was all this red wood which he brought from California. And the whole place, it just looked like Noah's Ark. It was really bizarre. But it was really mystical. You know, you would I remember walking into the temple for the very first time, and you could feel the atmosphere. It was just electric. It was just a wonderful atmosphere in this little rented house in the center of London. Only a few minutes away from the British Museum, not very far away from Oxford Circus. It was really in the heart of London. And we were living there. There was, it had about all oh, six floors. There was a basement, which was where we served prasada. And there was the, the ground floor, was the temple room. And then above the temple room, the first floor was Prabhupada's room. And then above that was another floor, which was for the Mataji's. And then above that, the Prabhu's state. So, like the, the, we were occupying the whole building. And when I became a devotee, there were about 18 people living there. There were two ladies, and the rest were all young men. There was one Indian that was, later on he became Subhag Swami. When I joined, he had not yet received his initiation, but he was living there in the ashram with the devotees. I remember when I went to the temple and I saw him there, I thought, oh, this is unusual. Even an Indian is joining this. <laughs> of course, <laughs> practically now it's, our movement is majority of Indians, you know. But in those days, the movement was new and we were all Westerners. But Subhag had joined. His, his parents had sent him to England to get an education because they saw when he was in Calcutta, his native was Cal, native home was Calcutta. His parents were worried that oh he's always going to temples and he's associating with all kinds of sadhus. We'll send him to England 
and he can get education and forget about all these things. But when he got to England, the people he met were the devotees. And he very quickly moved into the temple, became a full-time devotee. And went on, now he's of course, he's, he's got many thousands of disciples and travels around the world. He's over 80 years old. He's a wonderful devotee. So I had the good fortune. We all took initiation together when Prabhupada came. We were about 18 devotees, two ladies. One was French and one was American. There were no British ladies, first of all. <laughs> the one lady had come from France. She was supposed to go to India. Later, later on, what happened? Prabhupada came to London and he asked her to go to Russia and marry a Russian. <laughs> And she, she did it. She married the first Russian devotee. Prabhupada had gone to Russia and he'd met a young Russian man who was very interested in Krishna consciousness. And so Prabhupada thought it would be good for him if he could have a nice devotee wife. So when Prabhupada came to London, there was this one French lady there. She was the, the Pujari. She was the only one second initiated, and she was serving the deities, Radha, London, Ishwara. And we had also Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra also. So we were the only temple with big size Radha, Krishna, deity in the world at that time. London was the first temple to have big size deity. And what had happened is the people who had come from America, the three couples, they'd come to London and of course they'd met with George Harrison and everything and they'd got the, they got the building, the renting building in London and then Prabhupada came and Prabhupada said, all right, now come to India with me. I want you to come with me to India and we will begin our world Sankirtan movement. And although they had made such wonderful people devotees like George Harrison and they had made an impact on the whole world with their recording of the Hare Krishna mantra, they left everything and went with Prabhupada to India. They were so deep, they were so attached to Prabhupada. Prabhupada had given them that mission to go to England and then Prabhupada came and saw that they had established the society in England. They said, now you come with me, we'll go to India. We will begin the world Sankirtan preaching. And so the devotees said, yes. <laughs> They've been in England long enough. They were happy to go with Prabhupada, right? You, they just wanted to follow Prabhupada. They would go anywhere on Prabhupada's orders. And so that was the mood in those, those days. You see, the devotees were completely dedicated to Prabhupada. Whatever Prabhupada wants, we would do it. The girl, the French lady, she went to Russia and she got married to that first Russian devotee in 1972 or 73. Uh, yeah. Devotees were, and you don't, what were Russia, of course, at that time, it was locked down, it was communist, it was very difficult. But devotees, this, this is pioneering, this is the, the the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So it was it was very exciting, all of these things, you see? And for the devotees, as, as young people, young people growing up in the West, we wanted that kind of excitement. And Prabhupada gave us that opportunity. He gave us that adventure to go and do something for Lord Krishna and establish Lord Chaitanya's movement around the world. 
And so the devotees were doing these things. And I, I came into the temple in London, there was only the one French girl there. She was the only one second initiated. The temple president, at first it was Mukunda Goswami. Well, Mukunda, he wasn't Goswami at that time. But then he went back to America and the president became an 18-year-old brahmachari. He became the temple president of the only temple in London, you see. He was only 18. He, he could hardly read or write. You know, he, he didn't have any, hardly any education. But he had, in, he had great enthusiasm and dedication. And he loved to do Sankirtan. And we would go out and chant and dance every day. Our whole program was Sankirtan. You know, we were all just young people and how to spread the Krishna consciousness movement. We didn't know really what to do, but we would go out on Sankirtan. And we would go every day, winter or summer, hail, snow, rain, whatever the weather was like, we would be out there and chanting and dancing. And that went on for years. And it became so much a part of London that when they asked people, they did a survey from people in London and they asked them, when you think of London, what do you think about in London? They say, oh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> they said, whenever we go to London, we always see Hare Krishna dancing and chanting in the streets. So that, that was the mood. And we've continued that in England. Even today, they still have regular, almost daily Sankirtan. So we would go out and chant and dance. And people would come and chant. They would like to dance with us, come and chant with us. At that time, even, there was a, there was a musical which was being performed in London, in the theatre in London. The musical was called Hair. And in that musical, they would also sing Hare Krishna. <laughs> and they were singing Hare Krishna and dancing. And some of the ladies who were in the show, they would come on Sankirtan with us. They would come on, they didn't want to come on Sankirtan with you. And Prabhupada said, they got this chanting of Hare Krishna from our Hare Krishna movement. So he said their chanting was bona fide. And he was very happy that they were chanting Hare Krishna. You know, in India, so many people chant Hare Krishna. And often it's influenced by Maya Padi and all kinds of wrong conceptions. But the Western world, they got Hare Krishna they got it from Srila Prabhupada and from the Krishna Consciousness Movement. It was the devotees who brought that Sankirtan movement and they brought it on the streets everywhere. If you went, when you went to USA, everybody in the USA, every city, they would have devotees chanting and dancing. And we would be seen distributing books in the beginning, when I first came to the Krishna Consciousness Movement, you know, they told me, oh, we distribute books, and they said, we, we have this Back to Godhead magazine. It was a, a magazine which had been produced for new, new people, for people to introduce people to our Krishna Consciousness Movement. And they, they told us that just if people give you a donation, then take it. But don't pressure them to give you money, right? So that was initial. That was when I first came to the movement. That they had said like that. That if you get a donation, it's nice. But we don't we don't force people to give donations. However, after some time, you know, we were giving out books. We were not getting much money, and Prabhupada was concerned. 
He said, oh, this is not good. He said, if we don't have money, how will we be able to keep printing the books? He said, you have to get something for the book. They have to at least cover the printing costs. So Prabhupada said, any gentleman, they will give 25 cents for our magazine. They must give something. He said, they cannot expect to take our books and not contribute. So then we started to distribute the books and request donations and get something for them. So that went on for some time. We were distributing little books and Back to Godhead magazines. And then some few years later, Srila Prabhupada said, actually, book distribution means big book distribution, not just little magazines. Prabhupada said, we are printing big books, you have to distribute them. If we don't distribute them, how can we print more books? Prabhupada was writing, he was translating the Bhagavata. He came from India with the first canto in three volumes. It was mentioned this morning. Charanjeeva Prabhu was giving class about Srila Prabhupada and he was saying how Prabhupada had brought his edition of the Bhagavata, which was done with letter press. In the old days, it was a very art, very slow, very laborious system of printing books. And Prabhupada had to do everything himself. He had nobody helping him. He would write, he would type, he would go to the printers, he would check what the printers had done. And so when the book was printed, there would be quite a few mistakes, a lot of errors. But uh, anyway, Prabhupada brought these books to America. He printed them in India, he sold some of them. He did get orders from different government libraries, but when he got the chance to go to America, he was very sure to bring his books with him. And he had crates, he had three crates of the books, one crate of each volume, and he had them put on the ship. And before he got off the ship in America, he sold a set of the books to the captain of the ship. And the captain, Captain Pandya, gave him 20 US dollars for the three books. Prabhupada said that was the only money he had when he first got to America. And he said, 20 dollars, he said, that's just a few hours spending money. It doesn't go. So, like this, Prabhupada got some money and he brought the books to America, and whenever he did a program, he would go and sell, try to sell the books. He would introduce them to people, and he was regularly public writing. He got the second canto. Initially, when he first printed the second canto, it was done one volume, one chapter at a time. Each book was one chapter. So we had this, this ten chapters in the second canto, so there were ten books. And like this, this was how Prabhupada was publishing the Bhagavata. We got the second canto, one chapter at a time. And then Prabhupada printed Krishna book, printed the, the first volume came out, and then the second volume came. I had brought the first volume, the first volume. Later, after I joined the movement, then the second volume came. So these Krishna books, they were printed in Japan, from Dainapan, they were printed in, in Japan. And on the inside of the book, it said, not for sale in India. <laughs> yeah. and, and so whenever we had these books in India, Whenever people saw the book and they saw how it said not for sale in India, they said, I want that book. 
because that was the, the mentality in India at that time. They wanted whatever was in the West. So we had this Krishna book and people wanted it. And so it was very nice to distribute Krishna books to people. And Prabhupada, initially when devotees first came into India, we were doing Sankirtan and we'd go on the street just like we did in the West. We would go out on the street and try to distribute books. So when they came to India, at first they did Sankirtan and they would they didn't have really any books in India. Initially, Prabhupada came there to India in 1970, 1970 and 1971. There were no books. Even I remember I came to India in 1975, and uh, you know, most of you guys were not even born. But I was there in 1975 in Calcutta, and we would we were trying to just preach and distribute books and I remember Bhakti Charu Swami was a he was he had not yet moved in the temple. He was coming, visiting the temple. He was he's from Cal he was from Calcutta. So he started coming to our Calcutta temple and the temple president was a devotee called Abhirama Prabhu. And uh, he was cultivating him, speaking with him, encouraging him. And uh, he wanted to read a book. He'd been to other different gurus and ashrams, and he wanted to know more about Krishna consciousness. So he said, can I have a book to read? Problem was, there were no books. We didn't have any books. 1977, practically, there were no books. Everything, had, whatever books we had, we brought them from the West. When we came on the flight, we'd bring as many books as we could carry. And they would be immediately absorbed, taken by the devotees. Because they didn't have any books there. So we had Bhakti Charu is there and he wants to read a book. What to give him? We only had one Bhagavad Gita. And we were using it to have class every night. Yeah. So they wanted to give him the Bhagavad Gita. But I protested. I said, no, come on. I said, we can't give him that. We won't be able to have class if we don't have a book. It's the only book. It's the only Bhagavad Gita we have. I said, give him this book, Nectar of Devotion. So they said, OK, all right. You know, you, we'll keep the Bhagavad Gita here. And we gave him the nectar of devotion. And he took that book and he read it cover to cover. And he fell in love with it. And he thought it was the most wonderful book. And it brought him to Krishna consciousness. And later on he helped to translate that book to Bengali and see it published in Bengali language. So anyway, try to understand the situation of our movement in the 1970s there, how Prabhupada came to India with the dancing white elephants. You see, Prabhupada had been preaching in India and nobody wanted to join. Prabhupada was asking them, come and join me, come and preach with me. But they didn't want to join. They would say, no, I want to go to Singapore and work in the factory. They would say, no, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a sailor and go on the ship. But Prabhupada said, why not come and preach Bhagavad Gita around the world? You're Bengali, why not preach Bhagavad Gita? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Puti Duti Achi Yot Nagarodi Gram. But they will say, no, no, I want to go to factory in Singapore. What can we do? So Prabhupada came to the West. He came to the West and he got young people there in the West. And then he brought them back to India. Because Prabhupada knew the Indian mentality that they liked everything from the West. 
They want him to be like the Prophet said the Saab. Right? Saab meaning the white man. The white man. These white people, they came to India and they kind of had big positions really governing India. So they wanted to be like that. Of course, now the situation is reversed. And just recently, we had the Indian man become the Prime Minister of England. <laughs> the situation changes. In the past, English people went to India and ruled India. Now Indian people went to America and to England. They've become one is the Vice President in the USA. You have Kamala. And, and you have this other, and you have this other man, Rishi Sanat, who became Prime Minister in England. So like that, people became very, the situation changes. For the rest. That's true, Jantatata Swami Maharaj ki jai. Huh? Continue? Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about Shuru Prabhupada, my memories of Shuru Prabhupada and the early years there in the Krishna Consciousness Movement. How we had no books in India in the beginning. There were no books, of course. It took, it took time to get books. But I re somehow they managed to get some books, they started to print the books. And uh, I remember Kumbh Mela, 1977. Prabhupada went there. Srila Prabhupada was not well, he was sick. But he had come there to Kumbh Mela. And the devotees had come and they managed to print some books. Gopal Krishna Maharaj was in charge of the DBT and he had printed, managed to print books and they brought them all to the Kumbh Mela. And the devotees were distributing books very nicely. Kumbh Mela, millions of people come and they're all looking for some kind of spiritual path. They're looking for something. They're all interested in spirituality. Millions of people. It's the biggest gathering on the planet, in the Kumbh Mela, only once every 12 years. So 1977, Srila Prabhupada went there in January, it's in the month of March, it's cold. Alhaba, Prayagraj is called today. It's very cold, but Prabhupada tolerated, he came there, and the devotees were there, and Prabhupada told the devotees, don't go until you distribute all the books. <laughs> they brought a lot of they printed thousands of books. They brought them all there, magazines and everything, all kinds of little Hindi magazines, they go in magazines. We didn't have much books in print, very little printed in other languages, maybe nothing in Tamil, because we had nothing in South India at that time. So we just had some Hindi, some English, some Bengali. But Prabhupada told the devotees, don't go, don't leave here without distributing all the books. So that was Prabhupada's instruction to us at that time in Kumbhamila. Prabhupada was always eager to see us uh, preaching and doing the same kirtan. He appreciated the efforts of the senior devotees to organize our movement. Uh, and he, when he saw the devotees in Los Angeles all wearing a kind of uniform, you know, the ladies all had the sari, the same color, and the men were all dressed in the same, nice, the same kind of cloth, and Prabhupada thought, oh, this is very nice. You could see that some organization was there. We had our uniform, and the devotees would go out and chant, and 
they would all dress, you know, the ladies all in the same color of sari, and the men also with their shaved heads and wearing the dhoti. Like the so Prabhupada appreciated that all oh, somebody is organizing, somebody is managing nicely. He, 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 was, he was always appreciative of the managers of the Krishna consciousness movement. And you can see how Jatapaka Swami Maharaj also got a lot of mercy from Prabhupada because he was also a very senior manager. He was managing the Mayapur project. Initially he was in the Calcutta temple, but then they got the land in Mayapur. And they got the land in Mayapur, it was just rice fields, there was nothing there. The devotees had to go and stay there, and uh, they had to get, they had to arrange to get cement. To get cement, it was so difficult. Everything was rationed. You had to get permission from the government to get cement, to get steel. Everything was rationed. So the devotees were living there. Small Krishna Goswami told us one time, he said, they were building the very first building, which is the Lotus Building in Mayapur. When you, those of you have been, how many of you have been to Mayapur? Many of you have been there, right? Yeah, many. So in Mayapur, you know, there's the Lotus Building, there's the Chakra, there's the Gada, there's the Conch, there's so many buildings there. So the Lotus Building was the first building. But the devotees were putting up that building, were building it. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj described how when they first got the steel and they got the cement, and they took a picture of it and they sent the picture to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, what is this? <laughs> this is just a picture of steel. I want to see the building. I don't want to see steel and cement. Put up the building. So like that, Prabhupada was really pushing. He really wanted a nice building put up there. And of course, he did a very good job. That Lotus building, it's still, it's a very nice building, very good there. Big verandas. Prabhupada designed these different things. He said how he wanted the buildings put up. He wanted these big verandas. And he was living there, when he would come to Mayapur, he would stay in the Lotus building, enjoy being there. He said also that the mosquitoes in Mayapur have no mercy. So he, he was aware what it's like in Mayapur. Prabhupada, wherever he would come, he would always come to the Calcutta temple. Before he went out to Mayapur, he would come and see Calcutta, give a class there, he'd have an evening program, people would come to meet him. And the same in Delhi, I remember in Delhi also. In Delhi, we had just a very small house, little rented house. 1975, we were in a place called Bengali Market. Bengali market. It's in, in, it's in Delhi and in the center pretty much. And we were living there and we had the deities Radha Radha Partha Sarati And we were about eight devotees. Again, I think maybe one or two Indians, the rest were foreigners. We were living in the house there. And Prabhupada would come. Prabhupada would come and visit us and he would want to meet people and we would invite the different people to come and meet Prabhupada and Prabhupada would talk with all the different guests coming. I remember in Delhi, it was very difficult in Delhi. Nobody liked to stay in Delhi. Calcutta is a bit better because Calcutta is Bengal and Bengali, you know, Bengali sweets and you get nice prasad, nice vegetables and things and big In Delhi, it's a bit more austere. It's dry and very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. 
and you don't get a lot of variety in the mesh, at least in those days, in the 1970s, we didn't get much. It was like Tinder Subji, you know? If you know, if you're from India, you know Tinder Subji. <laughs> Everybody laughing. Yeah. So every day Tinder Subji, oh yeah. <laughs> So we're, we were living like that in Delhi, and we, we didn't have a vehicle or anything. We were just living from day to day. We were supporting the temple by life membership programs. And I remember Prabhupada came, and he wanted he he came to Delhi. This was a, and he talked. One life member had come, and Prabhupada would always ask him, "So what is your business?" So this one man said, well, I'm in transportation business. I have my transportation company. So Prabhupada said, oh, transport. He said, you know, I need transport to go to Vrindavan tomorrow. Can you arrange a car for me to go to Vrindavan? And so the man said, oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, I mean, the temple, we didn't have any cars or anything. We were just, you know, poor people. You know, we would go in office every day. But Prabhupada was so enterprising, he engaged this man to, to arrange a car to bring him to Vrindavan the next day. And so Prabhupada was so thoughtful about all of, all of these things. He was always good like to engage people, get them to do some service to Krishna. Similarly in Calcutta also, he come to Calcutta, he liked to go out to Mayapur and bring people and whenever you go out to Mayapur we would always stop halfway. You know in those days the road was really bad, a very difficult road. Nowadays it's wow we've got a super highway now, dual carriageway, very different. But in the 1970s it was really a diff difficult road. And, and it didn't take a lot of time to go out to Mayapur. Prabhupada would leave early in the morning and take breakfast halfway. And there was a mango grove everywhere, every time on the way out to Mayapur, coming back from Mayapur, Prabhupada would stop at the mango grove. And we would hunt prasada, send Prabhupada prasada. So I remember one time there was a big fleet of vehicles all going out with Prabhupada to Mayapur. And Gargamuni Maharaj had come from Germany with a fleet of vehicles, Mercedes-Benz vehicles from Germany. And he brought some brahmacharis also to help teach in India. Because we didn't get many people, we didn't get too many Indian people joining in those days. Now, of course, now the temples are all full of Indians, but initially people were, you know, a little suspicious, not very trusting about us. They thought we were all, maybe we were drug addicts or whatever, you know. Even Devanand had made a film about Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, and people were singing it everywhere to the devotees. So people were not really trusting the devotees. They wanted that our movement should be more established. They were looking, but not too many people were joining. So Prabhupada needed people to come from the West. That was how I came to India. Uh, I came in 1975. Uh, Gopal Krishna. Prabhu, he had been, he was at the, he had been in New York, and Srila Prabhupada had asked him to come back to India to help to develop the yatra in India because naturally he's Indian, he can speak Hindi, and he wanted him to take charge of printing the books. So uh, at that time I was in New York, I was in the temple in New York, and Gopal Krishna, he, he was to go to India. He wanted some people to go and he asked the temple president, can you give me some men to take to India? So the temple president said, you can have two. I'll give you two brahmacharis. So I was one. I, was, I got to go to Krishna Maharaj. 
He said, you know, I said, because, because you're British, he said, you can stay. He said, other people, they need visas. But at that time, he said, the British people coming to India can stay as long as they like. We were so we were so I came to India like that. You know, one way ticket and the idea to stay in India. And of course other people were also that people like Janani Vas Prabhu and his brother Pankaj Jangri, you know, they'd also come from the UK. There were other English devotees also there in Mayapur. And mostly we were probably said he said difficult for Americans to get visas. There was some tension between Indira Gandhi's government and the American government. And this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Indira Gandhi's government was in conflict with the U.S. government. And, uh, they said, U.S., these people from Hare Krishna, they're CIA, they're agents from the central, uh, the CIA, you know what I mean, the secret terrorists, and the come to spy on India. And so they didn't like to give visas for Americans, just like they're not giving to China people just now. In the past, they wouldn't give to Americans, you see. And, and so it said, Prabhupada told the devotees from the UK, that you come, you people from the UK, you come. Because many people were joining in England, we were getting many people joined. And so probably all you young men, you come to India, help us if we can establish a mission in India. And so I went to India in 1975, I was there in Calcutta. Uh, first in Delhi, I was in Delhi, I got jaundice. <laughs> you, you come to India, you have to expect you're going to get sick. You know, there were no bottled water, there was nothing like that in the 1970s. You, know, you drink water, you drink some water, maybe not so clean, and you get sick. So I had John this, I think Bhagavad Krishna Prabhu at that time, he told me, he said, go to Calcutta, he said, you'll get better prasadam there, you know, not just in the Sanji, you'll get some good prasadam in Calcutta. So I came to Calcutta, and very nice atmosphere there, nice devotees, and had good prasada, and a lot of preaching, and we had the opportunity to go out to Mayapur, and sometimes Jatpataka Swami Maharaj would also come to Calcutta regularly, he would be staying in Mayapur, but coming regularly to Calcutta, and associating, and encouraging, and inspiring all of us. So I have to stop now, thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Shabha Prabhupada, the Mataji says, especially the two rows, you just move to the back, you would like to put some beer.